you'll open your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel in the 8th chapter, we're going to go back in history to one of the most awful times in man's history, when Israel asked for a king. 1 Samuel chapter 8. What can we learn from those who ask for something ungodly? Because we know we can ask God for anything. And he's likely to give us what we ask for. But we need to be careful about what we ask for. Because we can ask for things that don't benefit our souls. Today we're going to look at one of the three most egregious sins of the Old Testament. That's in my opinion. Because these sins were so awful that here's what happened. God's progress was set back. An example, the spies said in the book of Numbers, we're not able to conquer the land of Canaan. Let's go back to Egypt. That sin was so egregious that it set back God's people from entering the land of Canaan by 40 years. Here's another sin, the golden calf, book of Exodus. Aaron, the high priest, said, this is your God who led you out of Egypt. Well, that's a lie, and it was such an egregious sin that it set the nation of Israel back spiritually, and many people lost their lives. Israel had been given the command that there should be no other God before God, and they didn't heed that. And here is the other of the three most egregious sins of the Old Testament. Israel asked for a king. All of these sins stem from the same problem. In fact, all sins have this problem. Man takes his attention off God, off the word of God, and focuses on the things of the world. And when he does that, it ends up in disaster. Let's read 1 Samuel chapter 8 and the first nine verses of the chapter. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second Abijah, and they were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. And all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you're old, and your sons don't walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, which, which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you. Now, therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. It's a lingering question. Why did Israel ask for a king? Have you forgotten the power of God? Have you forgotten your own history? Have you forgotten the greatest commandment, the first commandment? Do you not care for your own welfare? This will not end well because you're asking for God to give you something that he doesn't want you to have. You're committing evil here. And when you get this king and find out what it's going to do to the nation of God, they always struggled with the problems of idol worship. But after the kings came on board, it didn't take too many kings. Idol worship had become like a pandemic. Boy, when you read the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah and you read First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you know what you get? You get a nation that is prone to idol worship. It's unbelievable the scale of idol worship in those days. And it starts right here in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Why did they not believe Samuel's prophecy 
Mark this in your Bibles because we're coming back here, but let's go back to the reading in verses 10 through 14. So Samuel obeyed God, and he told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands, captains over his fifties, will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves, and give them to his servants, and we can go on, but to save a little time, we'll stop right there. The king is not going to represent you, ladies and gentlemen. He's going to represent himself. He's going to set himself up on the high ground, and he's going to use your sons and daughters to prop himself up in the lifestyle to which he wants to become accustomed because he's the king. You're going to pay a tax. He's going to take some of your land. Is that what you want? No, we don't want that then why do you continue to ask for a king? That's what we want to find out today. Why would you ask for a king after God has prophesied and told you, this is what your future is? The first thing I'd like to look at is Israel lacked trust. The 18th Psalm, 30th verse on the screen, as for God, his way is perfect. How can there be a better way than perfect? The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Consider some of the great leaders that God has raised up on his people's behalf. I'll go back to the great man Moses in Exodus 3 verse 11. Moreover, Moses was very great in the land of Egypt in the sight of all the people. Now, how do you think Moses got to be a great historical figure? You guessed it. It's because of the work of God. Why would you not think he can do that again for you? Let's turn to the book of Joshua. As I reminded you earlier, Mark 1 Samuel in chapter 8. But let's go to the book of Joshua because this great man Moses has died. What are we going to do now? Oh, goodness gracious, Moses, our great leader, is gone. The one who parted the waters of the Red Sea, the one who marched us out of Egypt, he's gone. What do we do now? We're facing dire times. Here's what you do now. You trust God. In Joshua 1, verses 16 through 18, so they answered Joshua saying, All that you command us we will do, and wherever you send us we will go. Notice the submission. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words and all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. That shows how much confidence they had in Joshua. We're ready to go. We've got a new leader. He's not Moses. This is a change of the guard. You know what we think about the change of the guard? We're ready to go. We're going to heed you in everything you say because we know that God wouldn't give us a weak leader. He'll give us a man to take Moses' place. We're ready to go. Let's turn to the book of Judges in chapter 8. <clears throat> we'll read about Gideon, just a couple of verses. Here again, Israel finds themselves in the grip of despair. Do you know about the Midianites? They came into the territory of God's people and they brought lots of people and lots of livestock and they trampled down the wheat and the produce and they helped themselves to the food and, and the nation of Israel became a backwater nation in their own home. And we need some help. Let's see what the book says about uh, Gideon in the book of Judges, verse 22, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, You rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. 
But Gideon, showing his leadership, watch this. He said to them, they heap attention on Gideon. Thank you, Gideon. You're great. You've rescued us from the Midianites. We were starving to death out here. Now we've defeated the Midianites, thanks to you. And here's what they said, or he said to them, I will not rule over you. I'm not going to rule over you. You shall, and my son shall not rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. What a great leader that is. Gideon's in a position to be acknowledged as a great, great man. And he said, nope, I don't want to be that man. I want the Lord to rule over you. Isn't that the same God that you follow here in 1 Samuel 8? Did not that God create Moses? Did not he equip Joshua? Did not he give the nation of Israel Gideon? And let's go back to 1 Samuel and look at chapter 3 for just a minute. A couple of verses, 19, 20, and 21 in 1 Samuel chapter 3. <laughs> so Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, and the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Look at the way God has blessed his people throughout the years. Here's the question. What would prompt Israel to think? God's run out of talent. Oh, he raised up Moses back in the day. We know about Gideon. We know about Joseph in Egypt. We know about Joshua, but our God has run out of the ability to raise up a man like one of those men, and that's why we want a king. Why would you think that? He can't raise up another like the legends of our past. God's not going to treat us like he treated Israel when they were crying out for help in the nation of Egypt. Our God does that for other generations he doesn't do that for us. Can you make an application? You live in the world today. Do you think we need help? Are we being spiritually stifled the way Israel was by Gideon? Are we being spiritually set back like Israel was as it lived in the land of Egypt? Do we not need God's help today? Will we ask God for help today, brethren? Or will we ask for a king? Has God run out of judges or prophets? No. Israel has run out of trust. Their dependence upon God has shriveled. David, Solomon, Peter, John, and Paul proved that God can raise up great characters no matter how evil evil is. It's like a Rolodex on an old-fashioned business desk. You know what a Rolodex is? It's like going through the Rolodex, the number of people that God has in a Rolodex that he can raise up to help lead his people. Do you think God doesn't have the power to take care of these corrupt judges, sons of Samuel, Joel, and Abijah? You don't think God can help you with that? Have you forgotten what God did to Nadab and Abihu? In Leviticus 10.2, fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. Do you not think God has a remedy for the evil of Joel and Abijah? Of course he does, but not if you don't trust him. Israel lacked trust in God, and they lacked faith. Separating faith from trust is difficult explaining it to an audience like this. I'm going to try to give it a go. I may not be perfect, and you may have a better way of explaining it than me, but it's obvious there's some kind of a difference by the way they're featured in the Bible, and I'm going to try to help us explain it. Trust is the confident expectation of something that hasn't happened yet. That's what trust is. Trust is, I'm in a bad situation here, and I need help, and I believe my God is going to rescue me. I haven't seen it happen, but I believe he will take care of this matter. 
That's what trust is. Faith is different because it's the substance of believing things that have already happened. We get our faith from learning about the word, things that have already happened. Let me give you an example. Do you believe Jesus Christ was raised from the dead? You didn't see that, but you believe that because that's what the word of God teaches. That's faith. Here's trust. Do you believe that he will raise you? I believe that he raised Jesus, faith. I have to trust that he's going to raise me one day. Trust is faith's deepest level. They are ultimate partners. Faith is something we have, and trust is something we expect to have because of our faith, and it's clear that Israel lacked both. Israel believed God had rescued the nation from slavery, but they didn't see it. It's hundreds of years after they came out of Egypt. Do you believe in the parting of the waters of the Red Sea? Yes, that's faith. It comes from your past. But they didn't believe that he could save them from their trials. That's trust, the present, the future. And in just about every spiritual failure in the Bible, Israel presents this concept to the reader. Let's turn to the book of Numbers quickly. <clears throat> in chapter 14, we'll read about these ten spies who betrayed God with their evil report. Numbers 14. We're going to read verses 3 through 9. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel because Moses and Aaron, like others, we trust God. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. In verse 3 of the reading, we see that Israel even uses the Lord's name. They believe how they got to Canaan, but they don't trust in God how God can make them conquerors in Canaan. First two points. How does this happen? Because you don't trust God and you don't believe the way you walk. And when you get into this predicament, the wheels have fallen off of that vehicle. You're not going far. Another point. We go back to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Israel was selfish. We're going to read verses 19 and 20. 1 Samuel 8, 19 and 20. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel after he prophesied about what the kings were going to do. And they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we may also be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. In these two verses, really in four lines, in the last line of verse 19 and the lines in verse 20, we see the use of seven pronouns. There's the selfishness raising its head. Seven pronouns. Personal pronouns, we use twice, us three times, our two times. 
It's all about me. Here's what I want. Here's what I think. Here's what we're going to do. Here's our. It's all about you guys. Where, where's the name of God in this little scene? As an example, who's different? In verse 6, when they said, give us a king to judge us, Samuel prayed to the Lord. You see, you guys are thinking about you guys and what we want, what we think, what we like, what we need, and you don't have God in the picture. You're very selfish. This is one of the roots of all sins. We may know what we want, ladies and gentlemen, but God knows what we need. And you don't need a king. You may want a king. You don't need a king. God knows the future. And God's already told you. These kings are going to steal from you. These kings are going to make you his slaves. These kings are going to take your children. They're going to take your money. They're going to take your assets to use in their war machine and to prop themselves up in a standard of living that they would like so they can be kings like the nations of the world. So many leaders of God's people prior to this time had been selfless. What can you say about Abraham and Noah and Moses and Joseph in Egypt? Matthew 21, verse 22, whatever you ask, believing you will receive, but you're so selfish, you want what you want, but you don't know how to ask of God. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Now that's a New Testament scripture. You'd be wise to say, hey, John, you know, you're reading out of the Sermon on the Mount, the words of the Christ. They didn't know those things. That's true, but let me put an asterisk on that assessment. They may not have known these exact words, but they knew of this concept. To ask of God, and he will give it to you. Can you give us an example of that? Yes, we can go back to Egypt. What were the people doing? God said the people were crying out to him, and he heard them, and he addressed their affliction. There it is. They were asking for relief. We need help, and God helped them. But Israel is so selfish and focused on the things of the flesh that they didn't know how to ask of God. Our last point in the lesson will be yours. Israel was worldly. These are four critical points. The lack of trust, the lack of faith, selfishness, and worldliness and this is how you defeat Satan this is how you get to heaven you defeat these four points right here in 1st John 2 15 through 17 do not love the world or the things in the world if anyone loves the world the love of the Father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and so is the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Worldliness suffocates the spirit of the Christian. Worldliness creates a rival that God doesn't really have, except in the imagination of the Christian's mind. Peter said... In 2 Peter 3.10, the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. If you believe that one sentence, how can we put things in the world ahead of God? How can we value the things of the world more than the things of God? Because we're valuing things in the world that one of these days is going to be wiped out. We may attach our hearts to the cares of the world, but that story has a bad ending, ladies and gentlemen. 
Israel is focused on Samuel's age. That's carnal thinking. It doesn't matter how old he is. He's the man that God gave you to be the judge. And you do well to listen to him and quit fussing about all this stuff. You're being petty. Looking at the kings of the world. You're being petty. You're being petty. You think those kings have something better than you have with God? You're being petty. They were also focused on the immorality of his sons, Joel and Abijah, who perverted justice. That's worldliness. And finally, they were focused on the kings of the nations. How long do you suppose they have fixated on those kings? Note the statement in 1 Samuel 8. Like all the nations. Can we talk about that just for a second and I'll be through? Like all the nations. I want to underline the word all. What's that teach us? Well, when have you ever seen a military parade in that day where all the nations bring their high school marching band and they parade down Main Street so you can see the armies of the world and get to see these nations and look at their kings? When have you ever seen that? You haven't. What does all mean then? Well, we had a war and we saw that king. There was another war, we saw another king, another king, another war, another king, another. And over a period of time, we've seen the kings of all the nations. You've been watching these boys for a long time, haven't you? And you've been talking about it. You've noticed it started off as a little tiny thing and we just kept noticing it and it grew and grew until we decided that's what we want to. They didn't see a king, see, and say, we want a king like that. They didn't see that. They saw the kings of all the nations. They've been watching these people for years, fixating on those things. We don't have anything like that. That boy's got a pretty chariot, doesn't he? I like the way that guy's got his hair fixed. You know what else he's got on a coat of armor? Boy, he, we don't have anybody. But this guy's fancy. He's a Hollywood heartthrob. Sitting up in that chariot. Horses, fine steeds, pulling those horses. Oh, it's beautiful to see that. And we're focusing on these things of the world. We're fixated on them. And we want to be like them. How could you be any better than to be a child of God? How could you think that to be like them is better than to be like I am? I don't value my relationship with God. I value that big dude who's sitting in that fancy chair. That's what I think is important. They lost their spiritual compass. A lack of trust, a lack of faith, not a lack of selfishness and a heap of worldliness put those people in a bad position. One of the most egregious sins in the whole of the Bible, or at least the Old Testament. I hope you'll take this lesson home with you and think about it because there's a lot of application. We can be like those people when we desire the things of the world instead of the things that God has given us. When we're not like Samuel, things are going on in the world. Let me pray about that to God. If you're in our audience today and we can help you get right with God, if you're not already, if you have any spiritual need, we encourage you to come to the front and let us address that need today according to the authority of the Scriptures. While together we stand and sing.